he's currently an assistant professor at NYU, where he leads a machine learning group. And his current research interests are in developing flexible, interpretable, and scalable ML models, which often invo involve deep learning, Gaussian processes, and kernel learning. Um, so with that, I'm going to give over to our speaker. Uh, yeah, Andrew, take it away. Thanks so much. Well, I'm really excited to be here. I'm still sort of imagining this 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 meeting room that we used to go to with the red couches and had many uh, exciting and passionate discussions where I felt like I really learned a lot. And Cambridge was a, a special place, I recall, in the sense that we got very deep into philosophical questions around model construction and generalization. And it's hard to find those discussions in other places. So um, that's something you know I've really valued throughout the years. And to that end, this talk is going to have a bit of a philosophical, but also a very pragmatic flavor. Like when we're talking about, for instance, whether a method is Bayesian, we'll want to consider Bayesian relative to what in the context of what experiments and what it is that we're trying to actually show. And that will be kind of a, an important theme throughout this talk. I mean, I think there are many methods that in some sense might not appear Bayesian, but if you're comparing them to other methods that are much further from the Bayesian ideal, we have to be careful about what kind of message we're sending. Okay. So let's start um, with uh, I'll, this talk. Uh, incidentally, will be sort of half on the whiteboard and half with slides. So we'll start with the whiteboard. And let's start with what we're typically trying to compute when we follow a Bayesian approach. So we're um, typically trying to form a, um, and let me know if you can't see what I'm writing, a predictive distribution. Great. of y, which this could be like a class label, a regression output, whatever, given some test input x star and our data d. And using the sum and product rules, this is going to be equal to our predictive distribution conditioned on our parameters w times the posterior over our parameters w given our data dw. So this is a, a Bayesian model average. This is just an uncontroversial expression of the sum and product rules of probability. And um, I see a note about questions. Uh, yeah, I, I feel welcome to, to unmute, definitely, yeah. Um, OK, uh, so, so this, is, this is the predictive distribution that we're trying to, to compute. And um, as we probably know, if we're um, doing classical training, like let's say we're finding um, a map solution. Then if we were to create an approximate posterior, which was um, centered at that solution, it was just a point mass, then we would recover the classical predictive distribution. So in other words, our Bayesian predictive distribution will be most different from regularized optimization when the posterior has a reasonable amount of functional variability. Um, uh, 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 and um, uh, uh, you know, is, is expressing a reasonable amount of mass where, they, where it has that functional variability. They'll be quite similar if the posterior is fairly contracted in function space in which case it might not be a terrible approximation to say that the posterior is just a point mass centered at the, the regularized um, maximum likelihood solution. Now, of course, um, the posterior will in fact be very different than a concentrated sort of distribution when um, we're considering really large neural networks, which can express many different solutions to a given problem typically corresponding to different settings of these parameters. And these are often um, relatively compelling but complementary solutions to the given problem. So there have been many great motivations historically, especially in the 90s, for following a Bayesian approach to inference in large neural networks. And I would say there are also many new motivations, new discoveries, things we didn't know about in the 90s, uh, like topological properties of the posterior, such as mode connectivity that we discovered a few years ago, showing that you could actually walk from, say, one SGD train solution to another in a subspace without really increasing the training loss very much at all along the way. And even more importantly, the different points along these connecting paths 
correspond to actually very different functions, which can be ensembled very readily for a much better solution. And more recently, um, just in the last couple of months, we actually posted a paper showing that you can find these very large multidimensional simplices of low loss solutions in the posterior. So um, there's this huge collection of models actually um, that all have very low loss and tend to provide um, quite complementary explanations of the data. And we benefit a lot, both in terms of calibration, but also um, predictive accuracy of our, of our point predictions when we um, consider all of those models rather than just arbitrarily trying to pick one of them. So I think in this context, just doing something like regular SGD training is especially arbitrary because it's not just the case that maybe there's sort of a global optimum and um, the other solutions have relatively low posterior density. In fact, there are these huge loss values in, in, in um, the objective functions that we're using typically to train these models. Now, um, there's a, a very popular heuristic procedure called deep ensembles. Um, and what it does is um, we have our neural network function, f of xw, and we retrain f of xw, let's say j times, to find a bunch of different sort of local optima. They're not really local optima because I said they're connected in these subspaces to find a bunch of different parameter settings. We'll call them W1 hat to WJ hat. And then we form one over J. to make predictions. And it's been found that this often um, really improves our, our performance when we follow this kind of procedure. Now, there was a, a large empirical study a few years ago comparing this procedure to, uh, at the time, fairly standard approximate inference procedures in um, Bayesian deep learning, such as using um, mean field variational inference with an approximate Gaussian posterior. Um, and um, the finding was that the deep ensembles often performed a lot better. And the, the common takeaway was that actually maybe something is really going wrong with Bayesian methods in deep learning. This kind of simple heuristic, deep ensembles, seems to be significantly outperforming these canonical approaches to approximate Bayesian inference with large neural networks. And so maybe we ought to really just think more about things like ensembling rather than um, you know, standard um, uh, Bayesian approximations in deep learning. And in fact, I remember this was actually a very common question a year or two ago at the uh, NeurIPS workshop for Bayesian deep learning. Why don't we just have a workshop about ensembling? Let's just forget about Bayesian methods. And um, I thought about this for a little while and it seems like a, a very odd conclusion because if we're just looking at what I'm calling equation one here, and just let's forget a bit about, you know, a standard approaches to approximate inference and simple Monte Carlo and all of this, and just think about this mathematically as an integration problem that we're trying to solve. Something like deep ensembles actually seems like a reasonable heuristic. What we would want to do is have, um, since we know that this is a very, very high dimensional integral, we're not going to be wanting to do many forward passes through this huge neural network. Typically the approximate inference procedures we use might be um, taking about 10 samples or so. It would get very expensive to carry more than about 10 models around at test time if we're trying to deploy these approaches in, in practice. Um, and if we did, it, you know, from this perspective, we probably wouldn't even want exact posterior samples. What if we got unlucky? What if the samples were redundant? What we would want is to try to find different parameter settings which um, represent sort of typical points in the posterior, meaning that they have a reasonable amount of mass around them and also provide complementary functional representations of, uh, of, of our model. So um, from this perspective, um, doing something like just retraining our neural network and um, trying to find different solutions that are reasonably far apart in weight space um, as a proxy for say function space variability, picking out different modes, et cetera, actually seems like a pretty reasonable thing to do. And if we wanted to take this a step further, we would really want to think about this as kind of like an active learning problem. Given where we've queried our model so far in weight space, where should we go next to reduce the error in approximating this integral as much as possible? And so um, indeed, when we actually compare the fidelity of our predictive distribution using something like deep ensembles 
um, with um, something like um, mean field variational inference using, you know, maybe an oracle, like really sort of exhaustively tuned um, full Hamiltonian Monte Carlo, what we often find is actually the deep ensembles are providing a better fidelity representation of that predictive distribution. And to be honest, it's really, I mean, you can think about this as an integration problem. And I think that's a little bit different than how people typically think about it. We don't necessarily need to focus, for example, on getting high fidelity posterior samples. That's not necessarily even what we would want to do. I think we should step away from the simple Monte Carlo um, perspective of these estimation problems, especially in, in modern deep learning. But you know, even putting that aside, it probably isn't so shocking that if we have a really, really multimodal posterior that something like deep ensembles, which is representing that posterior with a bunch of point masses at the different modes, might be better than something like a unimodal variational approximation. And this is something that we definitely see empirically, but I would say also this, this is almost kind of obvious when we think about it in these terms. Um, and so I think it's, it's, you know, it's, it's a bit silly in that context. We could sort of pick at this. We could say, well, if we kept retraining this model, surely we wouldn't eventually get a perfect approximation to our predictive distribution. Yes, I agree. I think the same criticism applies to virtually every deterministic approximation, including variational methods. No matter how many samples we take from an approximate Gaussian posterior, it's not going to eventually lead us to an exact representation of the predictive distribution. Only um, some MCMC approaches have that property. And quite often, we're not in, even close to that asymptotic regime where that might be true. Um, and also I would say, well, let's again consider the alternatives. So if we're sort of comparing a bunch of methods, some that are supposedly non-Bayesian and others that are supposedly Bayesian, and our conclusion is that the non-Bayesian methods outperform the, the Bayesian methods when the supposedly non-Bayesian methods are actually providing a better representation of the Bayesian predictive distribution, that's probably you know, more than a bit silly. It's even kind of problematic. Our conclusion is exactly reversed. And what we should take away from that is we need to do a better job still of trying to represent this predictive distribution. And then maybe we could hope to achieve better generalization performance. OK, so um, any questions about that? I'm about to show a few experiments, but uh, let me know if there are any questions at this point. OK. All right, so this is the integration problem we're trying to solve. Um, so Andrew, and, oh, go on, yeah. Sorry, I do have a question. I it just took uh, some time to get myself in, on music. Sorry. Okay. Hi, yeah. I'm Mate. Uh, you Good probably recognize you. me. Yeah. I do. <laughs> so, uh, so what your um, this notion that you know we really are not interested in the posterior for its own sake, but you know we, because in the end we want to compute that integral, you know the predictive uh, with it. Uh, that reminds me of you know some work that was actually done at the same time at around the same time when you were uh, in CVL uh, uh, by another alumnus, Ferenc, uh, on on loss calibrated inference. And so I'm what so and you already mentioned this potential link between. Uh, active learning and and um, and uh, and uh, deep ensembles. So I was actually wondering whether there might be a link to loss calibrated inference. Whether we, there's a way to see the there might there might be a way to see the samples uh, produced by deep ensembles as kind of samples that would be provided by a, a loss calibrated inference um, method. I don't know that's if, great... if that question even makes sense, but yeah, that's yeah, just a random thought sense. I had as I was listening to you. No, I encourage these thoughts and it's a great question. And yes, there is a connection both between that and other work that I think was that was happening in the group when I was there around Bayesian quadrature and ideas like active sampling. Um, so in a sense, if we're doing, if we're kind of viewing this estimation of this integral as sort of a, a Bayesian inference problem, then this might be a random integral. And rather than using something like MCMC samples from a posterior, we might instead just try to choose the locations of these samples to um, reduce the variance in this estimator. That's a procedure called active sampling. I think the technical challenge here would be the extraordinary dimensionality of this integral. So those, those types of approaches, which are also related to ideas like herding, um, uh, tend to, to suffer from a curse of dimensionality. A heuristic like deep ensembles helps us get around that curse of dimensionality. But of course, we could still do better and we should, which should try to do better. But my contention is that deep ensembles are doing better than a lot of approaches for 
approximate inference in deep learning. And I think um, part of this is because many of these approaches like mean field variational inference, even variational inference with a fairly expressive posterior tends to be fairly um, 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 you know, well studied in settings outside of deep learning where it does make a lot of sense. And um, um, we just sort of then uncritically apply these methods to, to deep neural networks where it may not make very much sense at all anymore, where we have these very unusual topological properties in the posterior. Um, uh, in terms of um, loss calibrated methods, yes, I think at least at a high level, there's a connection. Like I, I guess what I'm arguing is, well, it, we should be conscious of ultimately what we're trying to do, for example, with posterior samples. And in many of these experiments in these empirical studies, we're evaluating generalization performance, we're making use of the predictive distribution. So I think the relevant question there is, um, is how close is the predictive distribution that we're getting using these various approaches to some kind of Bayesian ideal? Mm -hmm. And then even then, once we have that predictive distribution, we might think about how are we gonna use that to make a decision? And I think that's also where loss calibrated inference comes into play. Great, okay. So um, as sort of a first sort of empirical experiment about what I think are these, these fairly intuitive ideas, um, we can perform exhaustive Hamiltonian Monte Carlo sampling. I mean, this is not a setting where we can do exact inference, so we can just try our best. And that's what we've done. And we can, we can perform fairly exhaustive Hamiltonian Monte Carlo sampling. This isn't something that is really practical in, in deep learning, but it you know, is something that we can try to do if we're willing to spend uh, uh, sufficiently many computational resources, which um, as I'll mention in a few slides from now, can involve hundreds of TPUs and tens of thousands of epochs even for trying to get a single sample. Um, and when we do that and we compare um, things like the Wasserstein divergence between the predictive distributions given by deep ensembles and standard sort of Bayes by backprop style variational approximate inference procedures, we find that the deep ensembles are providing a much higher fidelity representation of the Bayesian predictive distribution and also improve a lot more significantly as we increase the number of samples. In this context, number of samples for deep ensembles means number of independently trained models. And again, I think this is kind of intuitive. If we have this very multimodal posterior and the different modes correspond to quite different sorts of functional representations, it's not really gonna help us that much just to keep taking samples from a unimodal approximation. We can also explore this in a lot of other settings, sort of standard benchmark, CIFAR 10, corrupted CIFAR and so on, where here we've actually performed this exhaustive HMC inference again, doing everything we absolutely can to get high fidelity samples and lots of samples. And um, you know, we, we also sort of worked with sort of Matt Hoffman at Google to, to try to really make sure that this was as good as it could be. And what we find again is that the, the deep ensemble representation is um, much closer to the predictive distribution we get with very exhaustive Hamiltonian Monte Carlo sampling than things like mean, vari mean field variational inference, um, SGLD, stochastic gradient Hamiltonian Monte Carlo, um, cyclical uh, 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 stochastic uh, uh, Langevin dynamics, um, which is a, 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 an approach I proposed uh, a couple of years ago, uh, seems to in practice get the closest to HMC of the various different available kind of standard procedures. Um, but we see that deep ensembles is actually pretty competitive with that and significantly better than mean field variational inference in terms of approximating the Bayesian predictive distribution. So I'm not even talking about generalization performance here. Of course, we can keep improving. So um, it will help us to not just represent the posterior with point masses, but also try to marginalize within these different basins of attraction. So for instance, a very simple thing we could do is just have a mixtures of Gaussian representation for the posterior and um, we find indeed that when we do that, we do actually achieve better predictive performance than deep ensembles. Um, just just uh, to be clear in this figure here, we have a conceptualization of a multimodal posterior. In the second panel, we have the predictive distribution given parameters. And the point we're trying to make in this cartoon is the predictive distribution given parameters tends to vary a lot between different basins, but not so much within a basin. And here we have the distance between um, our actual predictive distribution versus our approximation of the predictive distribution um, uh, as a function of the next sample in W space that we might want to take. So this is almost like an acquisition function in Bayesian optimization, trying to emphasize that we maybe should be considering this problem as an active learning problem. And so we can do, we can do these experiments that were in this empirical study where they look particularly at CIFAR-10C and find that this um, approach, which also tries to additionally marginalize within basins, 
um, does uh, outperform deep ensembles, particularly when you have a small number of independently trained models or you have a lot of corruption in the data. And we'll actually come back to some results involving this method in a moment. Okay, so another um, challenge to the Bayesian approach in deep learning um, has involved uh, a procedure called posterior tempering, um, which was observed as um, you know, something that, that several, several various approximate inference procedures were doing. So just very briefly, um, the idea is we raise either the likelihood or the posterior to a power one over T. If T is less than one, then um, uh, it's said that we have a cold posterior. So we're kind of giving the likelihood higher weighting. Um, if t equals one, we have the standard Bayesian um, posterior distribution. If we have t greater than one, then we have a warm posterior where we're kind of have, letting the prior have a stronger effect. And it was observed um, that in certain settings, if we have a prior, which is just the standard multivariate normal distribution, n0, i, and uh, we have t less than one, we can outperform classical training. But um, if we have t equals one, sometimes we're even doing worse than classical training. And so it seems like it, you know, it can be very helpful to have t less than one. And this was um, sort of presented as, as kind of a problematic finding that uh, I'll, I'll get back to in a moment. Um, also, it was shown in this paper so that the, the, that was kind of the demonstration. And then there was this thought, well, why, why are cold posteriors helping? And one of the, the hypotheses was that um, the prior is very misspecified. Seems like an obvious hypothesis, right? We don't necessarily have a, a great idea of what kind of prior we might want to specify in, in weight space. And what they showed was that if you, if you sampled um, from this N0i prior and then looked at the corresponding functions that you get, so really what matters is the, the induced prior over functions, that these functions tended to be assigning most of the data in CIFAR 10 to a particular class. So this is just averaged over all of the data points in CIFAR 10. We can see this, this first prior sample is giving um, most of the data points uh, an assignment to class six. Uh, this other one is assigning most of the data points to, to class nine. So let's try to understand this result. Now, it might strike you as a bit odd that we're using N0i priors. And indeed, that's not really what we would use in, in practice. It's very easy to scale the variance of the, the prior. Um, so we could use N0 alpha i, and we could try to understand how this kind of behavior depends on alpha. So when we used alpha equals root 10, we were able to essentially sort of perfectly reproduce these results in the cold posterior paper where the different prior samples were assigning most of the data to a particular class. Interestingly though, the predictive distribution in the prior is pretty high entropy. It's pretty uniform across the classes as we would want. If we tune alpha, then we get um, more of a high entropy sort of distribution across all the data points for the different prior samples. And so this is like a very easy thing to fix, just tune alpha and we don't see this behavior anymore. And if we don't feel like tuning alpha through cross-validation, maybe we could just use what people always use for these benchmark problems when they do L2 regularization, which is a value fairly close to 0.3 in this instance. And so perhaps this is misspecification. I'll get to that in a moment, but it's also trivially resolved just by using an N0 alpha I prior. We can also, I'll get back to that last plot in a second. We can also see what happens if we use the misspecified prior and then observe you know, various different data sizes. So here we start with a prior that is giving high confidence um, assignments to most of the data points. Then we observe, observe just 10 data points and we, we can take two sort of posterior samples using SGLD. And we can see that there's very quick contraction. So the predictive distribution is now looking higher entropy, 100 data points. It's looking now just fine as data point, not too different in that respect. So what we see is that even if this is misspecified when we use the inappropriate prior scale, it's a very soft misspecification, which is very quickly modulated by data. And so, of course, our prior is going to be misspecified, but there are kind of different severities of misspecification. I would say something like misspecifying the signal variance of our prior is um, you know, not nearly as prob problematic as something like misspecifying the, covari the induced covariance function, how similar this prior over functions might perceive various different points. And we can relate this to what we know about Gaussian processes, for instance. If we multiply you know, our kernel by some constants and we observe some data, we'll see that we'll, we'll very quickly be able to sort of update based on that data and find an appropriate sort of amplitude scale. But if we choose an RBF kernel when really we, we should have chosen something different, like a spectral mixture kernel or Matt or something like that, then that can actually be very problematic. And it maybe doesn't even really matter in practice how many points we observe this kind of misspecification could really hurt our generalization performance. Now, this is just a, a quick plot I did um, uh, last night, and um, it's to show that 
if you take one of these prior samples um, with alpha between you know close to zero to about 0 0.3, um, and um, you evaluate it over different data points, you do get different sort of uh, uh, class distributions. Um, they're a little bit homogenous here, but that's just an artifact of the inputs that I'm looking at. Um, we can see that when we average them over all the different data points, um, it's going to favor different classes quite strongly for different points because it all ends up looking high entropy once we average across the whole data set. So it's not the case, for instance, that, that class three is always strongly favored for all the inputs. And we can see even here that there's a reasonable amount of variability. It's not completely homogenous. And this is for alpha equals 0.1. Okay, we can also examine the effect of the prior scale on generalization performance using this exhaustive HMC procedure where we've actually distributed the computations over hundreds of CPUs. And um, incidentally, I heard a debate between um, a group at Cambridge and Oxford about um, approaches to uh, uh, variational methods. And uh, as an interesting aside, it was, it was mentioned many times, so it would be very nice if we had sort of a reference to try to compare against you know, some kind of oracle for what the predictive distribution should look like. And um, I think um, given the lack of such an obvious reference, um, uh, uh, things like you know, the infinite width limits and so on were being considered. So we've also kind of invested a lot of this, this effort in building these, these uh, samples, um, both computational and kind of manual effort so that um, you know, as a service to the community so that we can kind of compare against these. So we will be releasing these samples and they, they could be used as a reference for comparison. So when we, we use this HMC procedure and we consider a variety of different variant scales, we see that the performance actually tends to be pretty insensitive to the scale. So this is more evidence that this is something that is modulated very quickly by data. And it doesn't really matter that much, you know, how we specify this prior scale. Uh, the top row here is CIFAR 10 with the ResNet 20. Um, uh, incidentally, no tempering. Um, and the uh, bottom is uh, uh, IMDB classification with a CNN LSTM model, uh, basically the models that were used in the, the cold posteriors paper went through it all. Now let's sort of think about the effect of tempering when we use this high fidelity HMC procedure. So um, we can see um, actually, if we're looking at, uh, in this case, uh, the, the IMDB problem, but this also applies to a lot of other problems. Um, uh, and we, we sort of look at performance as a function of temperature, we get the best performance pretty close to a temperature of one. So we don't observe the cold posterior effect. Now you might ask, well, is this, is, is this resolved by having higher fidelity inference? I would say, Partly, but um, it also depends on things like um, data augmentation. So there are two kind of non-Bayesian things we typically do in deep learning. Um, uh, we use batch norm and we often have data augmentation. Um, we found, we did sort of a bit of an ablation um, and this is actually using the exact code from the cold posteriors paper, so the SGLD. Um, when we um, remove data augmentation, we find that a temperature of one tends to be better than a variety of other temperatures. Um, it batch norm versus um, you know, other types of normalization that don't really affect the, the, um, the Bayesian interpretation doesn't tend to make that much of a difference with respect to cold posteriors. So um, it seems that the cold posterior effect that was being observed in that paper um, is largely an artifact of um, data augmentation. And um, I think this is quite interesting because um, I think it might be debatable how we should react to data augmentation, but I would argue that actually tempering the posterior might be a more Bayesian thing to do than just leaving it alone when we know that we should do something that basically our, our likelihood is being undercounted in some way when we're doing data augmentation. And I think, you know, just seeing what happens without data augmentation is completely uncontroversial. And um, we see in this case that a temperature in year one is favored. Okay. So I'll, I'll actually come back to um, this sort of idea of whether we should be alarmed by tempering. I think so far I've argued that um, in many cases, um, we don't see a lot of evidence actually for a cold posteriors effect. There's another question is if we observe the cold posteriors effect, should we be alarmed? And I think a lot of works have kind of just assumed that this is a very problematic thing. I think this is actually yes, an assumption that we should question and uh, I'll get back, back to that in a moment. But let's for, for a moment also talk about prior specification in Bayesian neural nets. So it's quite standard to use an N0 alpha squared I prior when we're doing Bayesian deep learning. Um, 
I would argue that there's a lot of evidence that this is actually not a particularly unreasonable prior. Surely it's misspecified in various ways. Every prior is, but it's not nearly as problematic as um, is often being assumed. Um, so um, there was a paper, for example, called uh, the Deep Image Prior, which showed that randomly initialized CNNs without training can provide really good performance for all sorts of vision tasks, image denoising, super resolution, and in painting. And this suggests that a sample function from our induced distribution over functions, which of course is really what matters, that's the, the real prior, captures low level image statistics before any training. Um, in a paper called um, Understanding Deep Learning Requires Rethinking Generalization, it was shown that pre-processing CIFAR-10 with a randomly initialized untrained convolutional neural net could dramatically improve the test performance of using, say, a Gaussian kernel on the, on the raw pixels from 54% accuracy to 71% accuracy. Things like L2 regularization, which are a bit like tuning that alpha parameter, the scale of the, the prior, only led to very marginal um, further gains in performance. And so um, I think that this is sort of intuitive in a sense. Like if someone asked me, what should we do to construct better priors in Bayesian deep learning, a lot of my mental energy would actually be directed towards architecture design. The prior over parameters in isolation has no meaning unless we can sort of combine it with the functional form of the model. And um, certain neural architectures like convolutional neural nets have all sorts of properties like translation equivariance, which we desire in modeling high dimensional natural signals. So in thinking about you know, how could we specify a better prior, I think it would be probably most fruitful to think about what kind of architecture do we want to use for the problems that we're considering? And um, the exact details of the distribution over weights um, might have some effect, but it won't have nearly as much of an effect as the architecture. And so the architecture is really doing a lot of heavy lifting. And that's why um, the prior over functions induced by even these fairly generic priors over parameters um, can be quite reasonable. Now, I said that um, the types of properties that we would care about a lot in doing this prior specification would be things like the induced covariance function. And this is something we can also examine. So when we use um, this, this standard Gaussian prior, in this case with different values of alpha, and look at the empirical correlations between different data points, like different MNIST digits, for instance, we find that um, digits of the same class and visually similar looking digits are a priori more correlated than digits of different classes and visually very different looking images. And I think, again, this is kind of intuitive. It's a good thing to check, but it's what we would hope for in using something like a convolutional neural net. These types of, of, of neural architectures provide a, a very good sort of implicit similarity metric for high dimensional natural signals, which is why they, they tend to perform very well in those settings. In this rethinking generalization paper, there was an experiment that showed that um, convolutional neural nets, um, while they could generalize very well on noise-free image classification problems, could also fit um, uh, images with just completely random labels and achieve basically zero training loss. And this was presented as in the face of everything we know about generalization, because it showed that these conv nets could um, significantly overfit these problems, but they weren't in practice. And, um, in this paper about Bayesian deep learning and probabilistic perspectives of generalization, in addition to a lot of other things, we argue that this isn't very surprising and it's also not distinct to neural nets. In fact, this is behavior that we can exactly reproduce with Gaussian processes. So in the first row here, we have some prior draws in panel A um, from our distribution over functions using a GPU with an RPF kernel. In panel B, we observe some, some reasonable looking data points and we have our predictive distribution, which also seems quite reasonable. In panel C, we also have a lot of corrupted points, but we also see that the predictive distribution of the GP can, can adapt to that and um, run through all the corrupted points perfectly. And so um, my interpretation of this is that the red curve is not something that we would sort of see if we were to sort of sit there and just keep taking prior draws. It's not you know, anywhere near a, a likely function from um, our distribution over functions in our prior, but there is support for that function. And so if there's a strong enough likelihood signal we can provide that fit to the data. And um, in a sense, um, our prior over functions should say that these types of data sets are unlikely, um, but not necessarily impossible. Um, we don't want to rule out solutions that we think are plausible, even if we think they're improbable. And we can exactly quantify this using the marginal likelihood, which says, what is the probability that we would generate a data set if we were to sample from uh, our distribution over parameters in our prior? And so we can compute, for example, the approximate GP marginal likelihood on corrupted 
CIFAR and show that it decreases very significantly as we increase the number of altered labels. We can also show that the Gaussian process can get 100% training accuracy on these corrupted CIFAR problems and also provide reasonable generalization on the uncorrupted problems. We can do the same um, by computing the approximate marginal likelihood for a Bayesian neural net under these standard priors and show that indeed the model can fit these types of data sets, but it really has a strong bias against fitting these types of data sets if it can avoid it. This is more evidence that these standard priors are reasonable. We could experiment with various different types of priors. So here we're considering the standard Gaussian priors, mixtures of Gaussian priors, a heavy tailed logistic prior. And we see that the heavy tail prior in this instance where we're considering a, a CNN LSTM model on, on IMDB uh, performs a little bit better, but there's not really that much of a difference. So we can definitely do better than the Gaussian prior, but um, it's not a terrible prior. It's kind of competitive with other types of alternatives that we might want to consider. And so I think this also drives home the point that architecture design is going to be more important for determining the prior over functions than the precise details of the distribution over weights. We can also look at phenomena like double descent. So here we have the classic double descent curve, where as we're increasing the capacity of our model, first we start to provide better generalization and then we start to overfit. And then as we keep increasing the capacity, we actually get better generalization again until we reach better performance than we would have achieved at all in this classical regime. Um, this is sort of a, a question I'm posing to the, the audience. Should a Bayesian model experience double descent? In this paper, I argue that it shouldn't if it's well specified. So if we're using a prior that we believe in and we combine that with exhaustive marginalization, um, performance should probably improve monotonically with increases in flexibility. And this is definitely argued, at least philosophically, at a high level by um, Radford Neal, by uh, Carl Rasmussen and, and others. I mean, Carl can <laughs> say something if he disagrees, but there was quite a nice paper um, uh, by, by, by Carl and Zubin about Bayesian Occam's razor. And there was this question of, you know, what order polynomial should we choose? Uh, or in this, I think they were sort of looking at Fourier series in that case to fit a given problem. And of course it, it depends on the induced prior over functions. But if you have a reasonable prior over functions, then you should actually favor um, the, the model with a lot of parameters because we do want to actually have flexibility. We just also need to be careful about our inductive biases, which functions are likely under our priors. So I would contend that if we're using a reasonable prior and we're combining that with exhaustive marginalization, then performance should improve monotonically with increases in flexibility as long as increasing flexibility means um, increasing the support of our prior such that we're including models that we believe to be possible, even if we think that they're not probable. And indeed, when we use this um, multi-swag, this mixture of Gaussians approximate posterior, and we do sort of you know, marginalization with that approximate posterior, um, uh, with this standard Gaussian prior, we do see that performance improves monotonically with increases in the number of parameters of this model. Um, we also see that there's a very large performance gap between this approximate Bayesian marginalization procedure and classical SGD training. So CIFAR 100 with 20% label corruption is getting just more than 45% error. So this is just point predictions even that we're looking at. Whereas with this um, multimodal um, posterior marginalization, um, we're getting below 30% error. So that's, that's, a, that's a pretty significant gap. We can see with the unimodal approximation, we see less of a pronounced double descent curve, but it's still there. We also see that there is a pretty big gap in accuracy between the unimodal marginalization and just classical training using a point mass. So we still have something to gain from being you know, a bit more Bayesian, trying a bit harder to marginalize our posterior. And I think this is also a question that I would like to emphasize. Like we can always point out ways in which our approximate inference procedures, our priors, et cetera, are imperfect. But when we're, and we should do that, but when we're considering these questions, we have to also be very lucid and conscious about the alternatives. If we're not gonna use this imperfect procedure, what other imperfect procedure are we going to use? And is it actually better? And I would contend that at least trying to approximate this integral is going to give us a better result than not trying at all. At least try to somewhat represent our epistemic uncertainty and clearly articulate where we might be missing you know, something important. And that can help us propose you know, better methods still. It's also notable that SWAG and SGD have the same training time. There's more computational expense associated with, with multi-SWAG. All right, so function space priors. So I think, as I've said, we should embrace the function space perspective to constructing priors, but we also have to be careful here. Um, so if we're contriving priors over parameters to induce distributions over functions, 
that resemble familiar models such as Gaussian processes with RBF kernels, we could be throwing the baby out with the bathwater in the sense that we already have Gaussian processes with RBF kernels. And so we don't need to reinvent the wheel here. Um, neural nets are a model class in their own right because they have often different inductive biases that lead to good performance on certain applications like modeling high dimensional natural signals, images, et cetera, audio waveforms, um, video. And um, uh, we want to sort of preserve that when we, we take a Bayesian approach to estimating these models. And so I think this is something we have to be careful about. And as I said, I think this actually amounts in many cases to architecture engineering, thinking about what kinds of symmetries we might want to represent to a given problem. And maybe we don't want exact symmetries. Maybe thinking about convnets from a Bayesian perspective would be saying, well, let's start with something like a fully connected net. Let's use a zero mean prior over the parameters. And let's also have small variance for any connection that doesn't exist in a convolutional neural net. Then we have a, a distribution over architectures, which is a priori concentrated around convolutional neural nets, but doesn't rule out other types of solutions. Um, and as a kind of a quick aside, I would say, um, you know, pack Bayes is also an interesting framework for trying to provide generalization bounds in um, deep learning where we have distributions over our weights. Um, we, we often get a bound that depends on um, something like equation four, where P can be loosely interpreted as a prior, Q is a posterior, and uh, non vacuous bounds have der been derived by exploiting flatness in the posterior. I think this is a promising framework, but it tends not to be very prescriptive about model construction or informative for understanding why a model generalizes. So what we would do to improve the bounds is often very different than what we would do to improve generalization. As I've mentioned, it's very important to try to characterize these multimodal posteriors, whereas these bounds actually aren't that affected by having a multimodal Q. You just get a log factor. It doesn't really change things very much. I've also argued that in some sense, we want a fairly diffuse prior. We can often improve the bounds a lot by having a very concentrated prior. And this could be partly an artifact of the bounds still being relatively loose, even if non vacuous. So what we do to improve the bounds won't necessarily be what we do to improve generalization. I think we can derive a more prescriptive approach to model construction just by thinking about support and inductive biases. And trying to have as much flexibility as possible in the sense that we're not ruling out solutions that we think might be possible, but also being very conscious, very careful about how we calibrate our inductive biases to this problem. And finally, um, a few thoughts about tempering. So um, we found actually very little evidence for a cold posterior effect when we use this sort of more exhaustive Hamiltonian Monte Carlo procedures, when we remove things like data augmentation, um, but I think it's also interesting to consider, supposing there were a cold posterior effect, how worried should we be about that? And I would argue that um, it would be surprising if a temperature of one just always happened to be the best setting of this hyperparameter. Um, that would seem very unlikely for many reasons. One of the reasons is, of course, our model is misspecified. And I think, actually, we should try to acknowledge misspecification in our estimation procedure. And part of that could include um, uh, procedures like, like posterior tempering. So I would actually say we should always do tempering as long as it's you know, uh, uh, computationally convenient. It's not really getting in the way of something else. I mean, we have to not always do everything we want to do, but um, I would say, assuming it's not a big inconvenience, yes, let's do posterior tempering because our model will be misspecified no matter how hard we should try. And we should try hard to specify our likelihood in our prior, but there'll be some room for improvement that we, we you know, can't really close. And uh, in this sense, uh, we would want to do this. Uh, so I would argue, philosophically that actually a tempered posterior in many cases is a more honest reflection of our prior beliefs than the untempered posterior. And that Bayesian inference at a high level is about honestly representing our beliefs in the modeling process. I would also say, and this is just um, sort of uh, jumping to something that's sort of not on the slide here, um, that um, tempering isn't really that different than a lot of procedures we already do take for granted and don't question as particularly non-Bayesian. So if we're thinking about something like regression with Gaussian noise and using a Gaussian process, uh, raising the likelihood to a power one over T in its effect on our predictions will be a lot like changing our noise variance. And our noise variance is something we almost always learn when we use a Gaussian process. And we don't question papers that try to learn the noise variance as being unreasonable or particularly non-Bayesian in some way. I think we do want to learn aspects of our likelihood. And in this sense, tempering is actually reminiscent of a lot of those procedures. Um, I would also say that um, while the prior is kind of misspecified, 
I think the result of assigning one class to, to most of the data is just a soft prior bias, which doesn't really hurt the predictive distribution in many cases. And um, one sec. Uh, and um, uh, can easily be corrected just by trying to set the, the prior scale appropriately and is quickly modulated by data. Uh, what's more important are things like the induced covariance function. Um, and uh, I think that the results also in the cold posterior paper could have been affected by things like lack of multimodal marginalization. There are a lot of things that were also kind of different from the Bayesian ideal when the tempering procedure was being performed. And um, there can be cases as well, given the severe computational constraints we face in um, Bayesian deep learning, where even a very well-specified model could benefit from tempering or a perfectly specified model. As kind of a simple example, we could imagine trying to estimate the mean of a high dimensional Gaussian distribution with a mean of zero. Um, uh, the, the samples that we might take will, will, will all be concentrated at a radius root, root D. Um, and uh, if, we, if we do uh, uh, tempering in this case, we'll actually be able to more efficiently um, construct a better estimation of our mean. So overall, I think there are many reasons to be excited about the Bayesian approach in deep learning. And I think many of these reasons are actually new. So there are many old reasons that still apply that were very well articulated by David Mackay and, and Radford Neal and others. Um, but uh, there are also new discoveries like mode connectivity, the existence of these large loss valleys that contain many different low loss solutions that provide compelling and complementary explanations of our problems. And uh, we should really sort of, for this reason, strive to see how well we can do in approximating things like the Bayesian predictive distribution and take inspiration from approaches like deep ensembles. I think we should also scrutinize the approaches that we, we are using, but we also should apply the same critical scu scrutiny to the, the critiques. Um, we do need to kind of police the police in some sense to make progress as a community. And we should be careful. So I think, you know, um, we should pause for breath as well before just saying, well, the priors that we usually use in Bayesian deep learning are horribly misspecified. So I'm proposing this other prior. Please do propose the other, other prior, try to do better, but let's not just assume as proven true something that actually might be quite questionable. And let's try to represent the full story. We, we have tried very hard to investigate the properties of these priors to try to understand the results of this cold posterior paper. Um, there are some papers that are coming out recently saying things like um, data set curation might have an effect on things like tempering, which uh, could be the case. Um, I think it's, it's questionable. I think that if you curate a data set, it just comes from a different distribution. So it doesn't necessarily mean you want to, to temper, but by Occam's razor, we know that, you know, that the augmentation is the most likely culprit here. Um, that, that's a very simple explanation to what's happening. Um, I think um, there's a lot of sort of evidence that um, the standard priors for Bayesian neural networks also have useful properties that we've gone through. Um, and, um, you know, in short, I think that um, we have to also consider the context when we're comparing different things. So uh, I think this, this, this study, which was sort of um, saying that, that the deep ensembles was performing a lot better than the approximate Bayesian inference procedures, um, I, 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 sort of led to a number of problematic interpretations that kind of Bayesian methods really weren't working it, working um, for, for a lot of these, these applications like CIFAR and for, for data shift problems, and they just didn't really cut it. And in fact, if we thought a little bit more critically about what was happening, the takeaway could have been completely the opposite, that in fact, the approximate inference procedures were the issue um, and that um, deep ensembles, in fact, were, were providing a, a higher fidelity representation of the Bayesian predictive distribution that we would want to compute in those settings. So the answer might actually be to try to be more Bayesian rather than less Bayesian. Um, just as a note, since I didn't mention it when I was talking about deep ensembles, there are some interesting differences between ensembling methods and Bayesian methods generally, like ensembles in some cases can work by enriching the hypothesis space doing model combination, whereas um, a Bayesian model average is more representing uncertainty over which hypothesis might be correct, but it assumes that one of the hypotheses is correct and um, will converge on that given enough information. I think that this distinction doesn't really exist between what we're calling deep ensembles and Bayesian model averaging because, again, we're just taking modes in the posterior, so we will see claps in function space. We're not enriching a hypothesis space. We are doing model averaging, not model combination. That's everything. Thank you. Thank you so much for your excellent talk, Andrew. Um, for questions, we imagine a lot of people want to ask things, so we're going to ask you to either type something in the chat or, or raise your hand on Zoom and we'll call on you. And then with, when things get a bit less busy, then we'll uh, have sort of an open discussion and, uh, and stop recording. Um, so I'm going to allow everyone to unmute themselves.
And um, yes, if you have any questions, please uh, please raise your hand or type in the chat. Uh, Hong has a question. Hey, Andrew. Thanks a lot Hello. for the talk. It's very uh, insightful. I have one question uh, on a plot you showed. Um, I think it's from the rethinking generalization paper where you uh, look at uh, the class label correlation under the CN model and you show that uh, data points from the same uh, uh, digit family will be more correlated. I think it, sorry, it's the next slide. This one? Yeah. Mm -hmm. So I wonder whether people have looked at uh, this uh, correlation map under some sort of uh, model averaging paradigm. If you specify, say, zero mean Gaussian prior on the weights and then do model averaging under the prior, do you still observe the similar correlation structure? Uh, that's a great question. I believe that we do, but it's been a while since I've looked at this, so I would need to, to double check. Um, I think the answer is yes, but I, I would need to, to double check. OK, mm -hmm. cool, thanks. Thanks. I think the next person is Adria. Um, hi, Andrew. Thank you for the, the great talk. I, you've actually made me uh, fairly optimistic about uh, Bayesian deep learning. So that's, that's, uh, that's always welcome. Um, but I want to, I want to uh, push back a little bit on, on, the, on the priors being actually correctly specified or close to correctly specified, right? I think, uh, I think you present very compelling evidence that the misspecification is not that bad, but the, it, it still has some troubling features. Like for example, the slide that is currently on screen with the correlation matrices, um, the correlation is very close for all classes and all mm -hmm. uh, points, right? That, that's kind of weird. Um, and if you, if you look at what uh, correlation does a neural network with value nonlinearities have, um, a, if you look at the infinite limit and you look at the correlation, you can show that as the network gets deeper, the correlation gets closer to being one for all the, like the matrix is basically once everywhere, mm -hmm. uh, right? The limit over depth is that. So it's a pretty weird prior. It's weird that it seems to work too, uh, right? But as you as you show here, the, the, like this neural network, I think it's probably a different architecture than the ones with with Bachner, because they don't they don't quite have this behavior. But mm -hmm. um, it works even if it has this prior structure, which a priori we, we wouldn't have really believed. And also the tuning the signal variance thing, uh, because of the softmax, it makes the class probabilities more equal, but still one of the class probabilities, also because of the relation of one everywhere, ends up being slightly higher than the others for all data points. So these are weird features of the prior, which if we're trying to improve it, maybe we should take a look at and, and, and pull on, on the thread and, and see what, what comes out. Yeah, I totally agree. Uh, so I think yeah. that, um, so I, I also sort of was a bit troubled by the, the similarity in correlations. Um, I, I was pleased that they were different for visually different looking examples and not just in this case, but in a few cases that we looked at. Um, uh, and I think those differences really affect the generalization performance and how the, the model responds to the addition of more data, even if they seem fairly small at the beginning before we've observed data. Also things like alpha do affect the differences. So I think even small differences can have a big effect on the inductive bias uh, that um, mm -hmm. you know, will help the model contract to a good solution as we have more, observed more data, which also could explain why we still achieve really good generalization even if the differences aren't that pronounced. Um, I think it also depends on the design of the architecture. So if we're very careful to include kind of symmetries and so on, which I don't think we were in um, this MNIST example, um, mm -hmm. uh, we, we sometimes see a more pronounced difference. And I would say in a way, this is what architecture design has been doing, at least implicitly. It's been trying to construct a better covariance function for these types of problems yeah. um, where um, it, it is actually kind of a hard thing to do otherwise. Like I say, GPs, kernel methods typically struggle in really high dimensional input settings because it's harder to think about what would be an intuitive similarity metric in those 
those settings. And I think part of the strength of, of neural nets is not just having a good prior similarity metric, but they also learn a representation. They're kind of doing kernel learning under the hood as we train the models. And this, um, this, this is actually really important in these kinds of settings. And they have good biases that help them actually learn these interesting non-stationary kernels. In general, non-stationary kernel, learn, kernel learning is very hard to do. And it's something that mm -hmm. neural nets actually do reasonably well. And I would say this is, um, I probably, we, we both uh, agree. I think we've discussed this a little bit also where sometimes the infinite limits differ from the finite analogs. The infinite limits often have a fixed kernel. Whereas with the finite neural net, uh, whether we're Bayesian or not, we're sort of like updating our, our similarity metric as we get more data. Yeah, okay, thank you. Yeah, that's, uh, that's a very good point. It's good to still be a good, thank you. Mm -hmm. I think that the, the next person was happier, but just before you asked your question, uh, can I just uh, ask you, Andrew, do you have to leave properly at five or can you stay a little? Uh, let me just double check. I think I can stay. Let's see. Yep, I can stay for a little bit. Okay, good. We just want to be respectful of your time. Thanks. I'm happier. Go ahead and ask a question. Uh, thanks, Austin. Yeah, Andrew, uh, thanks for an amazing talk. I thought that the uh, HMC results were very cool, uh, specifically. But I want to ask you about the double descent phenomenon, which uh, I think you cover briefly. So mm -hmm. something I've observed is that in, in a lot of papers that touch on this topic, uh, they investigate it under, uh, under data noise. So. Uh, I think you had some corrupted labels in your case. Is that right? And I was wondering why uh, why that was. Why is the uh, double descent phenomenon more pronounced under uh, uh, when the data is noisier? Yeah, this is a very insightful question. So you'll notice in any paper that's about double descent, typically they'll they'll be having a, a reasonable amount of label corruption. If you have no label corruption, there isn't that much of a, a pronounced double descent behavior. There's maybe a little bit, but it's actually very hard to find. It gets um, more and more pronounced the more label noise there is. My understanding of this is uh, double descent is partly an artifact of things like sort of overfitting. And so if you have more label corruption, it is a bit easier to overfit. And we see this, this curve um, kind of in a more pronounced way. Um, I also have kind of another understanding of double descent from the non-Bayesian perspective somewhat that like, um, as we increase the capacity of these models, a number of parameters, we actually, um, like the flat regions in the loss surface are occupying a much greater volume in this high dimensional space. And so they're much easier to find using optimization procedures like SGD, but even a variety of other optimization procedures. So basically, as we increase the width of the different ResNet layers, um, we're uh, uh, enlarging the volume of these really flat solutions. And um, so we're finding solutions that do correspond to flat regions of the loss surface. And these tend to actually be more regular solutions. They're more compressible. There's a lot of functional homogeneity in, in different directions. Um, and uh, in a sense, they're, they're providing us actually with a simpler solution to the problem, which has fewer effective parameters, even though it may have more parameters on the surface. Um, but yeah, the answer to your question is, I think um, double descent in, in many ways is uh, an artifact of overfitting and it's easier to overfit when we have the label corruption. So that's often why we see it in these double descent curves. All right, thank you very much. Great. And I think our last question is Vincent. Uh, hey, Andrew, thanks for the well, talk. Um, so yeah, I, I guess I agree with you that we should probably like care more about the functional prior than, than the weight prior, right? And that we can build better priors by better architecture design. Um, but one thing I was wondering is that most of these architectures that we design are used for maximum likelihood inference, right? Like most of the neural networks like ResNet20 or something, they're kind of made for normal SGD training. Um, and so then they find a lot of good solutions. And so I was wondering, like, if we have a Gaussian prior on the weights, does that really give us like a posterior that also includes all of these good solutions that we know that we would get in SGD training, right? Or might there be like better weight priors that we could maybe find to, um, to find these solutions in a better way to be like less restrictive in a sense, because Gaussian, I mean, due to the thin tails of the Gaussian, it's reasonably restrictive in how far the weights can get away from the um, origin, for instance, right? Yeah, this is a great question. And so, to be clear, I don't want to say that the standard priors we use are really great. I just think they have many useful properties and they're not as bad 
as it's sometimes being made to seem. Um, so in fact, because of the architecture doing so much heavy lifting, we're sort of saved in the induced distribution of our functions is actually pretty reasonable, even if we seem to have a kind of arbitrary and not very compelling distribution over the, the weights. Um, uh, in terms of flatness and so on, or sorry, the SGD versus uh, you know, um, uh, uh, the, the Bayesian marginalization procedure, I think that this observation about flatness in the posterior and, and lost valleys and so on is good motivation for following a Bayesian approach. It means that they're going to occupy a lot of volume in the posterior. So the same motivations for SGD would actually apply perhaps even more to, um, to doing Bayesian marginalization. I actually got interested in Bayesian deep learning after I heard a talk about optimization. Jorge Nosedal, one of the inventors of the LBFGS algorithm, was saying that because of these flat solutions, um, things like SGD might provide better generalization in deep learning. Um, the, the SGD finding the flat solutions, et cetera, because there's kind of a horizontal shift between training and test loss and so on. I thought, well, how would we actually use this in a rigorous way to improve our estimation procedures? It seems like we would want the explicit regularization instead of the implicit regularization of SGD. So we should change our loss function. If, if two different values of, the, uh, uh, of weights, which give the same loss, are providing very different generalization, then our loss is miscalibrated. We want it to be a good proxy for generalization. So we should introduce some kind of regularizer that makes the flat solutions have lower loss in our new loss function. And then we'd have to think about well, how are we going to define loss? How do we do our sort of flatness? How do we do, how do we do this very rigorously? Is it sort of going to be flatness in random directions? Are we going to use the Hessian? Uh, how much are we going to care about flatness? Um, how do we how do we sort of calibrate this complexity penalty and so on? And then um, you know, it's kind of a rabbit hole. We have to make all sorts of heuristic decisions that we probably don't really believe, and it gets very messy very quickly. Whereas if we perform just simple Bayesian marginalization, automatically we're going to be giving a lot more importance to flat regions of the loss because that's where most of our mass is actually going to be. Um, and so in a sense, I think this, this, this observation is great motivation for following a Bayesian approach rather than doing optimization. And with things like Gaussian priors, especially pretty vague Gaussian priors, we will be seeing sort of the posterior represent these flat solutions um, quite prominently and uh, will benefit then by doing marginalization instead of just picking one of them. I think also, yes, we probably can construct um, priors over parameters that might help us um, you know, benefit from things like flatness and might sort of have other kind of good properties in these ways. What I found sort of like in our experiment, we, we looked at a mixture of Gaussians and, and logistic priors. And I know you've looked at, at some, some, some other sort of possibilities as well is, is while they, they often do actually help a bit in some instances, there isn't like a, a, a major disparity between, between the performance uh, using these priors and, and sort of Gaussian priors. And I think this is partly because the architecture is doing a lot of heavy lifting. Although we do get into this question a little bit also in a paper that's forthcoming. And um, I, I referred to some of the results actually here, we're using HMC samples where um, things actually don't, I, I also don't want to be necessarily uniformly evangelizing for Bayesian methods in deep learning. I think they're very exciting, but the story isn't completely happy for Bayesian deep learning in this paper that, that, that that's coming out as well. There are cases where we see actually very strange behavior. And I think some of this behavior could be remedied by, by different priors than Gaussian priors. So uh, we'll sort of follow up on that, that shortly. Cool, yeah, looking forward to that paper then. Thanks. Thanks. Excellent, James. Cool. Yeah, thanks very much for the talk. Um, you sort of touched on the question I was going to ask in, in your previous answer here, but I guess I'll just ask it anyway, and, and maybe you can add some extra insights if you feel there are any. Um, I got the impression from, from your, your talk, as well as, as your answer here, that you're sort of advocating that we don't need to worry too much about um, doing inference in function space or constructing uh, priors with function space and specifically in mind and that you know you would place you know you would use your effort to um, specifically uh, investigate different neural network architectures and their corresponding effect in function space so I guess what I'm wondering is you know do you think there there is there is room for research into sort of functional inference and function space priors do you think there are any particularly promising directions um, for, for, for doing that? Or do you think it's not worth uh, spending time on and we should rather use weight space priors and look at uh, neural network architectures for their function space behavior? I mean, one of the things I love about Gaussian processes is we get to think about our priors directly in function space. It is a lot nicer and it's what we care about most. And this is why we often have very intuitive priors in those instances. And we can control the properties of these priors very naturally through thinking about kernel specification and selection. 
And so I really do love that approach to modeling. I think we just have to be careful that we're not reinventing the wheel when we do it with Bayesian neural nets, that we're not just proposing priors over parameters that induce distributions over functions that we can get actually a lot more cleanly through using a Gaussian process. Um, so I do think we should pursue the function space approach to constructing priors. We just have to be careful about how we do it and that we're not throwing the baby out with the bathwater because the induced distribution over functions in neural nets when we have just like a confnet combined with kind of a generic distribution over the weights might be hard to interpret but it does have many nice properties as it happens that help with generalization on many applications like image classification and so you know these these these, these models are sort of models in their their own right for a good reason and um we have to be careful not to throw the baby out with the bathwater but we certainly can do better than we're doing now. And I think a function space approach is, is quite a natural approach to the problem. In terms of what specifically we should do, uh, I think it's hard. I think looking at things like um, induced covariance functions is actually uh, pretty reasonable and something that maybe we should do more. Um, one thing that I found a bit funny about the, the cold posteriors paper is they focus so much on just like the sort of the predictions of prior samples. But you know, things like the covariance function are going to have a much greater effect on um, generalization performance and how the model responds to data. And so uh, I think looking at things like induced covariance functions could be a good direction in this sense. I think also sometimes these innovations can be driven by trying to solve very particular problems. So I don't want to spoil it too much, but there are some instances where performing Bayesian marginalization with um, certain priors can lead to very problematic results. And uh, maybe I'll send the, the link when it comes out in a week or so. But um, you know, these, 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 um, these examples um, can actually pretty directly lead us to using fairly different priors over the weights. Um, I think that architecture design is, in a sense, prior design and function space. So also, I think generically, as we all know, when people criticize Bayesian methods, they often say, oh, isn't the prior kind of arbitrary? How do you choose that? Isn't it going to be misspecified and wrong? And I mean, to some extent, that's all true. But we shouldn't hold Bayesian methods to a double standard. All these questions also typically apply to specifying the functional form of our model if we're doing classical training it's going to be a strong assumption it's going to affect our performance it's a bias we shouldn't hide from that let's just make our assumptions transparent and let's try to make some effort to represent epistemic uncertainty even if it's not perfect and um i think that um you know in in taking a function space approach to prior design i would really think about trying to build symmetries into models etc and i think this work also is is going to be useful for non-bayesian deep learning as well it's going to help us with our inductive biases etc and that's actually a direction that i'm sort of focusing on a lot right now in my group so we're going to be posting a few more papers where we're talking about how to build quite a wide class of different symmetry groups into convolutional and even um, multi-layer perceptrons and um, how we can try to learn these kinds of symmetries kind of automatically and how we can sort of specify priors that have biases towards certain symmetries, but they're more soft biases rather than restriction biases. And I think that's also a promising approach to prior design in Bayesian deep learning. Like um, this is a way in which priors, I think, can be very meaningful. Um, uh, we, we, we know that we sort of want certain types of symmetries, equivariances, et cetera, but we don't want restriction biases. And this is something we can calibrate very naturally and intuitively with the prior. And if we're doing posterior inference, we also can kind of rigorously characterize things like sort of soft um, invariances, et cetera. Um, and so I think that also could be a path towards constructing intuitive function space priors, thinking about things like symmetries, architecture design, and then combining that with distributions over, over functions. Cool, thanks so much. Uh, yes, hi, and thank you, Andrew, for the talk. It was really interesting. Um, so my question is a bit connected with the last one and regards uh, uh, neural network priors. So I was, uh, what's your opinion about uh, the recently proposed perceiver that use a sort of attention mechanism to learn directly on bytes and is kind of agnostic to the input modality? Um, it seems to me that, uh, from a probabilistic point of view, it's, it seems like a, uh, a sort of maximum likelihood type tool where you can learn your prior directly from the data. So uh, I don't know if you're aware of this paper, and uh, I just wanted to know what's your opinion about it. Thank you. Uh, it's a good question. Unfortunately, I'm not familiar with the paper, so I don't really have any comments. But if you, if you send it to me by email or something, I'd, I'd be interested sure. to take a look. But, sure, uh, yeah. sure. 
All right, uh, there's no one uh, who has their hand up at the moment, so I think this is a good time to uh, stop the recording and then we can continue having a, a discussion afterwards and keep uh, asking questions, it just, uh, just won't be recorded. So again, I'll, I'll end by saying thank you very much again to, to Andrew, you gave a really lovely talk and answered some very insightful questions, and I look forward to having a further discussion.